Ah, the art of thinking smart. We have today David Chang. He's a, he's a guy who thinks smart. <laughs> he he uh, operates Wealthbridge, his company right here in, in Pioneer Plaza. Yeah, am I exactly right. right. Yeah. Been around, been uh, chair of the Republican Party uh, for a time. Been in the past, right? And a graduate of West Point. Yeah. And uh, he is going to be a host, and he's going to host a show called The Art of Thinking Smart. And let me say how important that is. You know, if you look around, you see the successful people. There are various common denominators, and you want to identify what those things are. Right. One of them is they have to be able to talk on their feet. That's right. really yeah. bad. <laughs> Can't do that, you know. Another is they've really got to, you know, wrestle with complex issues and stay with it and make it happen. Right. Um, and so this, this show that David's going to do is going to be about being smart in the business community, being smart at home. What do you see the show to Just do, Just in David? life. I grew up in an immigrant family, came uh, from Korea, and uh, we didn't have much growing up. My parents worked really, really hard, and I was very blessed that uh, they tried to get us into good school districts. You're going to see that a lot. And at an early age, I saw that there were people that were successful, and there were some that were not. And I was always a reader. I wanted to see what is it that makes people smart and successful. Uh, hard work is important, but just working hard constantly 18 hours a day is not going to always do it and one of the things that i how did how come you yeah. didn't tell me this before <laughs> <laughs> you know what you still have plenty of time uh, and, and 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 it didn't just come to money uh, money was a big component of it but it's fulfillment in life their career their family lives of what how they define success was very important but the one thing that i found that linked everything together however you define success was the ability to think smart quick on your feet Just as you mentioned. Just think smart, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, thinking smart is making the right decisions when you need to, and life throws things at you, curveballs that you just can't anticipate sometimes. And the people that are successful aren't the ones that avoid them, but the ones that can react to it and hit that home run when that curveball comes. If it's a fastball, curveball, doesn't matter. They're prepared for it. And, and so growing up, reading up a lot, uh, I, I loved history, so I always read about General Lee, Eisenhower, Grant, MacArthur, a lot of our great U.S. generals. They all graduated from West Point, so I, I was 11 years old, <laughs> and I said... We're not talking about the admirals here today. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 exactly, right. <laughs> all right, and, and, I, and I said, they went to West Point, so I got to do so as well. And I've been blessed to graduate uh, 2002 from the bicentennial class. So West Point was founded in 1802, graduated 2002. Uh, instead of going straight into the military, and when I was a senior, we're called firsties, as senior at West Point, that's when September 11th happened. And we were the first class since Vietnam, knowing that we're going to go straight into combat. Boy, what a time that right. must have been. To right be after graduating. At 9 11, and to know the country was entering into another chapter right, right now. And many people don't know that West Point is only a mile, or I would, excuse me, an hour north of New York City. So it's very close. So it, was, it hit near and dear to us. And so uh, instead of me going straight into combat right after graduating, I was selected as East West Scholar. And that's when. I uh, came to Hawaii to get my master's degree uh, in uh, political science, Asian politics. So as you mentioned, I'm involved in politics. I really enjoy it. Four master's degrees. Uh, yeah, sort of. Why yeah, so, them off for me? Yeah, well, I got political science, uh, Asian politics from University of Hawaii as East West Scholar, MBA uh, uh, from UCLA, executive MBA there. Got a master's in theological studies and divinity. So working on uh, uh, those uh, types of degrees in very different fields, I realize that a lot of people think, you know what, being smart, I don't know this industry, or you know what, I'm not familiar with that. And good, smart people, wherever environment they're put in, are able to absorb their environment and still make smart decisions even when they may not have been born in that yeah. or raised in it. But inherent in that is the confidence to believe that you can do it. Exactly. And to do it and not to worry that you're going to fail. Right. Because you've got to be smart in terms of failure also. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. Uh, but today what I wanted to focus on, as you mentioned, uh, uh, I've been a wealth manager for a number of years. Last year, uh, I was chosen as 40 under 40 in America by Investment News. What's a wealth manager, David? So I help people with their financial planning, their investment planning, and then work with their CPAs on tax planning, attorneys, estate planning. So uh, in sum, I want to help people meet their financial goals in life. 
And, you know, you would think that, oh, that's an easy thing to do. With well, you just call David Chang. I guess so, right. <laughs> I don't have to be smart. I just have to have good advisors around me. Isn't that true? I, that, that's what you would think. But here's the thing, and I want to show this first graph here. And, and this first graph shows the average investor, this is from 1995 to 2014, received only 2.5% in returns. This is the average investor in America. That barely kept up with inflation, which is 2.4%. Now, if you had just done nothing and stayed in the market, you can see the S&P 500 over that 20-year span re returned 9.9%. Now, here's a kind of a funny story. Fidelity, it's an investment company, did an analysis of which accounts did the best of all the thousands of clients they had. And interestingly, as a joke, it was, the, it was the clients that had died or the people who had forgotten they had accounts <laughs> because they never touched it. Right? So, well, so maybe there's something smart about that. Or part of it. And one of the things that I have found is that managing your money, right? that's something that people have to be very smart about because if you're constantly in debt, if you're unable to provide family or for basic living, really it makes life difficult. So for today's first show, I wanted to focus on the most important question I believe I get as a wealth manager is, what is the smartest investment or financial decision that I can make? But you're not limiting your show to that, no, right? No, no. Can we take a moment, yeah. to digress for a moment, right, and sure. talk about where the show is going to range as right. it goes forward? So I'm still in the Hawaii Army National Guard, so I've done, uh, let's see, seven years active duty, um, a combat veteran, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and I'm still in the Hawaii National Guard. Uh, interestingly, I am the G2. I am the uh, Vice Chief of Staff of Intelligence for the Hawaii Army National Guard. So when you look at... Intelligence and smart. I, uh, see I guess so. In, in military intelligence. People say that's an oxymoron, <laughs> but it's not. We have very smart people in the military. I'm very proud of those that I've served with and got to really know and partner and be mentored by a lot of top generals that we've had uh, that come up through the ranks and are now still leading our army and also have retired. Uh, so Why I've learned a lot. Out, David? Well, active duty wise, I got out because I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. And part of the show is about the different business failures I've had, successes, and I've been mentored by some of the top business people in the world. Uh -huh. um, I've been mentored by top military uh, leaders in the world, nonprofit. And uh, part of the show, as you mentioned, is that I want to bring a lot of these mentors on, top folks that I think have so much to offer. And so The Art of Thinking Smart, I actually have a blog, the art of thinking, artofthinkingsmart.com, and I've written for midweek. Uh, here in our local paper every week uh, with the blog. I've had 400,000 readers. I can find readers. you in midweek right now. Uh, yeah, it depends on which, which uh, um, uh, edition, obviously, that comes out. Okay. And, and so I have about 400,000 readers uh, per week. I guess that's one, one of the data that I got with my blog in the weekly article written for tons of uh, national and local magazines and have done a lot of speaking engagements. And so... You sleep? Uh, <laughs> I don't have any kids. And, and my wife, my beautiful wife, she's the House Minority Leader for the Hawaii State House of Representatives. So we both have very busy schedules, and, and I'll be excited to have her on. Because being involved in politics, like I mentioned, and being at the upper echelons of politics, meeting with presidents. I traveled to Korea with President Bush, got to spend some time with him. Um, and military, business, politics, and even the nonprofit side, that's what I want to really have the show about, is no matter what background you come from, you can still learn how to think smart. And what did these, my mentors or people that I work with do in certain situations? And how I think in today's world, it's not about big or small, because you can ask Blockbuster or Borders, where are they now? It's about <laughs> how fast or slow in today's economy. And millennials Life changes, everything changes. Everything changes. Millennials, for example, there's a quote that every two years they're moving on to a new job. And there's no longer that 30 year pension that you're going to get. And if you look at General Electric, one of their top country, uh, companies in America, I respect them tremendously. Well, they got 200 plus thousand, 200,000 plus employees. But then you got Google, who's, you know, I think twice as large or larger than GE, who has only, I think, 50 to 60,000 employees. So what we see is that 
the future of thinking smart is not what happened in the past, but having to be flexible and moving quickly through uh, and navigating through what the future has to hold with technology, with how our economy is going. And that's what I want to talk a little bit today uh, about the smartest investment decision you can make. Yeah, and let's that, come back yeah, to that's, that. That's today's show, and I'll be very, I'm very excited about what we have, and I've, I think written several hundred articles on my blog and uh, uh, on, on different um, uh, speaking engagement and, and other magazine articles that I've written. So yeah, let's talk about that. And, and I mentioned that the average investor uh, only got 2.5% from 1995 to 2014. If I bring in 15, it's the same. And uh, no matter what, because we don't have the pensions that we did 30, 40 years ago, right? Uh, not when you enter the workplace. Well, after, right? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, but I'm not telling you. Exactly, right, right. <laughs> but uh, people don't have that financial security. So uh, used to be where you stay at one job, you work there 20, 30 years, and you're going to be taken care of. Now it's reversed where it's on the employee, the workers, that they have to save for themselves, either through a 401k, 403b, and job security isn't there as much as there used to be. And when you're jumping from job to job, it makes it very difficult to build up wealth. And I think part of thinking smart is building enough wealth so you can do what you love to do. In a perfect world, yeah. your job is what you love to do, so it's not work to yeah, you. Yeah, but a lot of people just don't do that these they don't. days. They live paycheck to paycheck. They live paycheck to I paycheck. I think that somebody, maybe Uncle Sam, somebody is going to take, take care of them. It's not true. And here's one thing to note. So our national debt uh, is around $17 trillion. If we had to split it between each taxpayer in America, it comes out to $150 Hundred sixty thousand dollars per person. Mm. So we have and a lot of debt. Kids too. Uh, uh, this is taxpayers. If okay. you divide it by all Americans, I think it's it goes down to like thirty, forty thousand. That's still, still a, a lot, lot right? Yeah. yeah. And and Social Security is the main income source for majority of seniors, and it was never intended to be that way. No. When Social Security was created in the nineteen thirties, not enough. Right. It, it was actually the average age that Americans lived was sixty five. 62, 65, and 62 is when you could get Social Security. Mm. But in, within a couple generations, mm. the average age of Americans living 80s, some cases 90s. So we have an issue that Social Security may not be there the way it is today for people in my generation, um, especially even for those that are just being born. Yeah, I mean, that is, you know, the, the, the age limits get higher all the time and uh, all the you know, restraints and uh, obligations of the Social Security program gets tougher all the time. Right. So it ain't what it used to be. Exactly. And in the future, it may not be at all. Exactly. This is why it's on us to manage our finances as well. And unfortunately, we're not doing that. There's a lot of information out there. And there are a lot of people that just try to make money. And oh. they may not have the best interest. That's the first issue, isn't oh, it? Recognizing it the problem. Right. A lot right. of people don't recognize the right. problem. Right, exactly. And so... Coming back to the question, what is the smartest investment decision anyone can make? So any of those listening uh, or watching the show, and, and it sounds like a big word, but I'm going to say it's two words, but it's called asset allocation. Now, Why not just buy S&P index funds? Okay, that's part of that, it. They were the best thing on your chart. That, that was, and, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, asset allocation, when I look at it, I don't mean just only the investment portion, but usually your entire life. And, and that's allocation, really, if I were to just sum it up in a few words, is just the optimal mix of investments that's right for you. And unfortunately, sometimes they put all their eggs in one basket. But why, you know, yeah. people always say that right sure. for you. Uh, what's right for me is as much money as possible. Isn't it? <laughs> and, and it's right for the guy down the road, too. It's as much money as possible. When I why say, does it have to be tailored? When I say it's right for you, it's got to be tailored, is because everybody has a different risk tolerance. So mm. some people, and the question I ask is, if 2008 were to happen again, and you have this investment portfolio, and you were going to lose 30, 40, 50%, could you sleep at night? I ask that question. If they can't, then most likely that portfolio is not right for them. So your risk tolerance is important. Your financial goals are important. Also, what's important is your time horizon. If you're someone who's time young. Time horizon? Time horizon. Time horizon. Yep. It's time to take a break. Can <laughs> we take a break? Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with Think Tech Hawaii, and I'd like to ask you to come watch my show, The Economy and You, each Wednesday at 3 p.m. 
Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. And I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Welcome. We are co-hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Business in Hawaii is a program that is positive stories about business in Hawaii. Uh, we're tired of hearing the negativity and why it's the wrong place to have a business. We talk about the positive reasons for having a business in Hawaii and, and how to be successful. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. The Art of Thinking Smart. Bingo, we're back. Now David Chang is going to tell us what kind of vitamin pills he takes to have this <laughs> level of energy. It isn't easy. What do you do for that? No, you know what? That is just my personality. I really enjoy what I do. And there's that famous quote, do you live to work or do you work to live, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so uh, I definitely live to work. And that's one thing Thinking Smart is about, is people out there, life is short. So do what you love. Do what you're passionate about. And that's what we do here, David. No that's kidding. That's good. That's yeah. great. And that's why I'm excited to uh, uh, start this with you, uh, the show, and, and bring on a lot of great guests. Uh, excited about that. And, and as we were talking about uh, the smartest decision, financial decision people can make in asset allocation. And there's always a time factor. And there's always a time factor, right? So we talked about your risk tolerance, your goals. And this next graph is a little bit of busy graph. And... Uh, is that a graph? Uh, yeah, well, a chart, I guess. It's like what, a what, Paul what, Clay what, painting with lettering on it. Right, and, and this is, let me tell you kind of what this means. On the top is the year. So you have 1996 all the way up to 2015. And the top row is the asset class. And an asset class is a class of investments. So you have, let's say, emerging markets. Brazil, Russia, India, China. You have maybe U.S. large cap stocks, small cap stocks. You got bonds. So you have different asset classes, and what you see is that the top lot are the highest performing asset classes, and then at the bottom is the bottom asset classes. Now, what this graph shows, I know it's just very busy, is that nobody knows which asset class is going to perform the best. Now, it may look like, okay, hey, emerging markets are doing well, but you can see 2008, it was at the very bottom, so it was in 2011 and 2012, 13. So what we see that, I, when I talk about asset allocation, is that because nobody knows which asset is gonna do the best, and you mentioned early in the show. Wait, wait, let's yeah. not leave that chart. Okay, can we sure. have that chart back? Yeah. Can we zoom in on that chart so we can see a little detail of what those individual boxes Right. saying, can and, we do that? And they could go to my blog, artofthinkysmart.com, and they'll is. see it. There it is. Let's but see what those boxes say. So you okay. see... Pick, pick one. Okay, so tell the, us what it you, says. you talked about the blue, the S&P 500 value. So okay. it's, uh, right. uh, you see it, and then uh, in that particular year, did 15.71%. All right. And now we're zooming into the Russell 2000. So the S&P 500, you mentioned, hey, why not just invest in that? Now, that's one asset class. The issue is, is that one year could do very well, the other year it may not do very well. So asset allocation means we're going to take almost, not all necessarily, but a nice group of each of those assets and combine them for you. Why not take all of them? You can't, some people do, yeah, right? Yeah. But they found that if you have more than 15 asset classes, then the benefits- It gets confusing. It does, the benefits usually aren't there as much as if you had maybe eight to nine, I usually keep around 13 to 11, maybe even the lowest three or four. Who makes the choices? The do, I, do I know enough to make the choices about which of those colored boxes I want? Uh, so some people don't. Um, I do that for our clients. But even if you're just starting out uh, by doing some research, uh, you could find out what is the best fit for each, uh, each person. And, and coming back to the asset allocation, the important thing is once you choose it, Right? You want to stick with it. Now, I showed in the first chart why the average investor does so poorly. Right? Why? It's because we are actually very, very bad at choosing investments, personally, because we're such emotional people. How many people at the bottom of 2008 sold their investments? 
right? How many people... A lot of uh, people. Exactly. Otherwise, it wouldn't have gone down like that. <laughs> they shouldn't be buying at that time, yeah. right? But yeah. they were selling at that time, and then people ended up buying right before the crash. Yeah. So again, that's one of the reasons we do so poorly is because we don't make smart <clears throat> investment decisions. But even, yeah. even if you're really smart, sure. and say it's 2008, and you see it going down, down, sure. you're seeing your nest egg shrink right. and shrink. Now it's 75% of it was, and 60, and 50, and sure. 40. At some point, you got to sell. Isn't that true? Uh, okay, so here's an example. So I want to show the next chart. I think the next chart is very important where it shows there that, okay, the variance in your portfolio performance. What this means here that the, the, the gains that you have, how much of it is it to selling or buying? That you talked about market timing. Market timing only makes up 1.8% of your, your, the variance in your portfolio, how well and how poorly it performs. 4.6 of it is the stocks that you choose or the investments you choose. Over 90%, 91.5% is the asset allocation. It's the optimal mix of the different and asset hold. classes. Buy and hold, buy and hold. in the, the asset allocation. And now, it's not just buying and holding because you want to rebalance as well. I want to go to the next graph that uh, we have here. This one here is performance of $10,000 from 1995 to 2014 in the S&P 500. Okay, so I, I didn't use an asset allocation to make it easy. I just didn't want to ask a class. If you're fully invested, your $10,000 would become over $65,000, about a 9.85%, 9.9% return. If you missed the 10 best days during those 20 years, just the 10 best days out of those 20 years, your return would only be 6.1%. So that means you lost half of what you could have gotten if you had just stayed in those 10 stayed days. Stayed on right, right on through. Yeah, like if you go on the, miss, the next 20 best days, it's another half, six The market to 3%. timing doesn't pay. Market timing does not pay, exactly. So the mess, if you missed the best 40 days, you actually lost money. If you missed the best 60 days out of 20 years, you lost 4%. So your $10,000 investment would only become about $4,600. So this is why, even if it's going down, and we know our companies are profitable in America, and uh, it's... We're looking at the long term. We're not looking at short term. So your asset allocation needs to reflect the long term. If you were going to retire within one or two years, you should your asset allocation should not have had so many stocks, which are aggressive. It should have been heavily geared towards bonds. But what I hear you saying is that you, you make these decisions based on a historical evaluation. Sure. And certain, there are certain axiomatic rules to follow, like hold as much as you can and rebalance from time to time and all that. Right. But, you know, you also said, David, and I want to get a handle on this, is that things are changing. Yep. And maybe they're changing more, more sweepingly, more quickly now than they ever did, not only here, but in the world. And right. the whole thing is interdependent now anyway. So, um, you know, Brexit had a big effect on the market. The, and terrorism has a big effect on the market. Um, you know, things like happened in 2008, that could happen again. Right, right. Probably will happen again. Yep. Um, and climate change with big storms, lots of destruction, failure of insurance companies. How do you build that into this smart sure. model? And, and part of being smart, thinking smart, is not letting your emotions drive decisions. That's the unfortunate thing that happens. Because nobody knows what the future will hold, that's why asset allocation is even more important, because Brexit. So when Brexit happened, Britain left the EU, the stock market just crumbled. Within a week, we were back to where we were beforehand. So let's just say you sold right after Brexit, when it was at a loss, right? And you missed that five days of it coming back up. You cut your... Yeah, you cut, like exactly. the chart Yeah, says. like the chart said. So preparing for the future is, number one, you want to invest and save. Because the purpose of investing, and I want to kind of bring it full circle, what is the reason people should invest? The reason for investing is not to gamble, but it's to have your money work for you, right? Because there's only 24 hours in a day. If I get paid an hourly wage, let's just say, I can only work a certain number of hours before I burn myself out. But by investing, you're having a pot of money make money for you while you're still sleeping. Those are smart thinkers, yeah. that they are leveraging what other people are doing. By investing, you're investing in companies where other CEOs are building up that company and you're going to take advantage of that knowledge. That's smart thinking, leveraging what other people do. Yeah. So part of investing is it to grow assets 
sort of. In 2008, there were a lot of multimillionaires, billionaires that owned a lot of real estate, but they didn't have any income or cash because people couldn't pay their rents or they left, or they moved out, and they had to declare bankruptcy. So when I say, what is the purpose of investment? The purpose of investment is to create income for life once you decide, you're going to turn on that spigot and say, I'm no longer going to work because I have enough investments that are going to provide enough income, like your ATM machine, so that I can do what I enjoy doing. Oh, you absolutely. Want to work? I think yeah. it's very important right. to develop a stash. And uh, at the end of your work life, which may come sooner than you like, right. um, that you're prepared to live. Right. And one of the things that we learn on these shows, you know, is that there's lots of homeless out there. Mm. And a disproportionate number of them are middle class people right. who didn't have the money to deal with illness and didn't have a retirement fund to draw down from. Right. Um, and who wind up with no money and having lost everything. And in the yeah. nuclear age, you know, this is a bad scene. Sure. It's happening more and more. So the problem is that if you, if you tell them this and you offer them this advice and this, this smart advice and all sure. that, uh, is it soon enough in their lives so that they can become aware of the problem, mm -hmm. deal with the problem, and avoid the, the homeless scenario? So, uh, very good question. Uh, and the best time to invest may have been in the past, but the second best time to invest is today, <laughs> right? Touche. Yeah, and so <laughs> it's never too late. We're living longer. And it's important that, and, and I always say this kind of to my team and staff, we're going to work full-time, part-time, so we can work part-time, full-time in the future. That means is part-time now. In these next 10, 20 years, we work really hard. So the next 20 years afterwards, you, can only, you only need to work part-time because you don't need to have to work full-time and, and, and because you need the money, right? So investing now, in, in this last chart that I have, uh, this graph we have is... one minute is, left now, Got it, compounding it. Why it doesn't pay to wait? If somebody from age 21 to 41 puts in $24,000, by the time they reach the age of 67, they have close to $500,000. But if you wait till age 47 to 67, 24,000 only becomes about 60,000. So it doesn't pay to wait. So that's why young people now need to see the importance of even stocking away $10, $20, keeping that asset allocation. Don't let the world uh, problems impact your investing decisions. You've got to get the word out right? there, David. <laughs> a lot of people do not know this. Uh, exactly. And, yeah, I mean, yeah. this, this is a, this not only smart, this is critical. Mm. This is a requirement in our time. The government is not here to help you. Right. Sorry I said here. that. Yeah. yeah. you got to help yourself, and you better help yourself now. And that's what the show is going to be about. That's what the show is going to be. Right. Looking forward to the yeah, show, thank David. You. I, I want to meet thank all you. your guests yeah. and see what you're going to do. Yeah, right, right. I want to learn from you. <laughs> and hopefully, if I really concentrate, maybe I can get smart. <laughs> You're already there. Chance. Yes, thank you. <laughs>